So yes, I'm Steve Moser. I am uh, use the pronouns he, him. And in addition to being a teen services librarian at Dayton Metro Library, I've also um, led our Band Books Week slash Intellectual Freedom Committee here at our library. And I also led the charge for us to become a book sanctuary as well. <clears throat> so just going to do a brief little overview here, which most of you probably already know. We know how important it is to protect the intellectual freedom and our patrons' right to read what they choose. We know that intellectual freedom has been under attack recently, and the books are being banned at an alarming rate. Um, even though the vast majority of Americans who have been polled are actually against book banning. We know that the most challenged and banned books for two weeks, or sorry, two years in a row have been books about or by people from the LGBTQ community and those by or about people of color. And we also know that reading outside our own experiences is one of the best ways to teach empathy and caring. So here's just a few numbers um, from the most recent numbers that ALA has released. These are for 2023 numbers so far from January through the end of August. Um, and it shows you how many attempts there have been to ban um, also unique book titles that were targeted, as well as the total um, number of titles that are targeted for censorship. And I apologize if I'm flying through this fast. I, sh I put a lot of information in here. Um, so the exponential growth in the number of bans and challenges that we've seen lately has really been owed to the fact that unlike how it used to be in the past, where most attempts at banning a book were for a single title, the vast majority of attempts are now for multiple titles. In fact, 92% of the book's cha book challenges were part of attempts to censor multiple titles, lists of books in many cases, and an alarming number of those um, were also for 100 or more titles in one fell swoop. <clears throat> so as of the end of 2022 last year, um, here's a graph showing how much the number of attempts to ban or restrict library materials has grown over the past few years. Um, you can see how it was holding fairly steady, like around 400, like three to 400 bouncing around up and down there. Um, but then in 2021, 2022, we've seen huge growth. Um, and based on the numbers so far in 2023, we may likely um, meet these numbers again or, or surpass them this year. Here's a chart, another chart showing the number of unique titles that were challenged and the exponential growth we've seen in that as well. And I can tell you in just the first two thirds of this year, we've already passed 2021 numbers and we still have a third of the year to go. So again, information I'm sure we probably already know, um, but just to review, the difference between a challenge and a ban is that the challenge attempts to restrict materials based on content, and the ban actually does remove them from the shelf. So at Dayton Metro Library, or DML as you'll see me abbreviate it uh, multiple times, um, we believe it's up to each individual person and each individual parent to decide what they read or what they allow their children to read. Um, it's their right to make those choices, but it's not anyone else's right to make that decision for them. 
Um, in fact, you know, we are curating a collection, including those commonly banned items. Um, and we have vowed to protect and maintain them in our collection. So I would hope that everyone already has a policy in place dictating how a book challenge is handled at your library. If you do not have this, I recommend getting that established as quickly as humanly possible so that you're prepared when this happens. Um, sadly, it's probably no longer a case of if it happens, it's more of a case of when it happens. Um, at our library, we have a form that someone has to complete after they've read the work in its entirety. Uh, a lot of people will read one little excerpt and will try to tell us that we need to remove this item from our shelves when it, you know, they've not read the surrounding context or anything. Um, that form is then sent to a committee of folks, including our collection development staff. Um, several librarians and several of our administrators. And the challenge is considered and the response is formulated by that committee. And um, I can tell you it is the stance of Dayton Metro Library that books will not be banned if a strong enough argument is submitted to justify moving it from one collection to another it will be considered, but that book will not be removed from our shelves. <clears throat> so we just, you know, wrapped up Banned Books Week. And this year in celebration of Banned Books Week, we held a special program to kick off a series of programs we're doing that are all based on intellectual freedom. So for us, we used Banned Books Week this year as a chance to promote our status as a book sanctuary, to educate the public, um, reinforce our commitment to having a collection of diverse books and intellectual freedom and protecting everyone's right to read. So this kickoff program featured three authors of color who are also LGBTQ plus com uh, community members. And we specifically selected these authors since those two communities I mentioned are the books that are most under attack in our country. They have all um, encountered issues with people wanting to ban their books. In addition to that program where we had them each present for an hour and they did like more of their general author visit kind of talk, but also focused on how book banning has infected them. So as part of our initiative, we also promoted the fact that we are now a book sanctuary. And so we doing that, we put all 500 plus staff members and volunteers in our library system in a book sanctuary t-shirt. You can see on the left here that this is my particular branch's picture of our staff members, you know, wearing our t-shirts and holding our favorite uh, band books. And um, so in addition to putting every staff member and volunteer in the library system in those shirts just to raise visibility and encourage people to ask questions, um, we also had book displays at set all of our 17 locations. And so in this way, we were able to let patrons know that we're working to protect their First Amendment rights. Um, the theme for this particular this book display was that we've broken the chains that others want on the books. Um, <clears throat> and it, year by year, it just seems to get easier and easier to come up with a display full of books that have been banned or challenged. 
At my particular library, we also have a display case. So we did an informational display there about how we are working to protect everyone's right to read. Um, we shared a lot of the statistics of you know, what has been happening across the country, uh, which I've already shared with you, and um, used book covers from some of the top, like most uh, banned or challenged books and information about all of that um, as a way to educate our patrons um, on the issue. <clears throat> Going back one year, my uh, when we first started the Band Books Week committee, it was for 2022. And my executive director asked me to lead the charge. And he asked me to put together something for Band Books Week that would make an impact. Um, so we did a variety of different things last year as well. Oh, skipping ahead too far, too fast. So we put together to kick off the week, we had a keynote speaker, which was Christopher Finan from the National Coalition Against Censorship. And he gave a great keynote about the importance of not censoring materials. And then we followed that up with a discussion panel, which included him, as well as our executive director, our director of college, our collection development. We had an award winning local author, a poet laureate, and um, English professor from a local university and assistant professor of reading and literacy from our community as well. And um, <clears throat> we had a great response to that. Here are just some of the questions that uh, we asked as part of the discussion. Those questions ranged from general um, questions to some things that were a little more targeted for particular people that were all, you know, part of the panel. We did give everyone involved a list of the questions that we were going to ask in advance. Uh, we also opened it up to questions from the community as well. The professors and educators that we had as part of the, of the panel have used banned books in their classroom and could speak to that. Um, the author has faced book challenges and could give us a viewpoint from the author's perspective. And the Dayton Metro Library staff members could speak to the challenges that we've experienced in the past. And then the um, Keynote gave a little more insight into just like an overarching view as well. <clears throat> Here's some more of the discussion questions. And if you want a full list, you can reach out to me anytime and I will, I can give you the full list. But we got like a day or two after this program, our executive director got an email and he shared it with me. And the feedback we received was, and I quote, myself and two of my friends attended the book banning and censorship discussion panel last night. I wanted to reach out and let you know how much the three of us enjoyed the panel. You and the library brought together an incredibly interesting panel of individuals. After we left, we spent some time at dinner conversing about the ideas that were discussed. I plan to attend more discussion panels held at the library in the future and just wanted to express how grateful I am that this topic was discussed as intellectual freedom is vital. So when we got that, I was, I was thrilled because to me, you can't get much better of a response than that. We also had a virtual uh, band book club and we had viewing parties at at least one library in each area of town that we serve 
And um, so people could join on their own from their own device, or they could come to the library and join in from each branch that we, um, that we have. It was an all ages uh, book club. We used the book Melissa by Alex Gino, uh, which you may know was previously released as George, but um, Alex did request that everyone change the title because George is dead naming the character of the book and he didn't want to, or they didn't want to make sure that we were not, they wanted to make sure we were not doing that. Um, we were open to any age from children up to older patrons. And um, the discussion was a basic discussion about the book like you would in a traditional book club, but also discussion on banning books and the importance of representation in literature at all age levels. And it worked out great that we could use Melissa for this book because, you know, it's accessible for children, but it's also, you know, gives a lot of insight through every age group um, from younger to older. We, in addition to that, we did have Alex Gino come to our library for an author visit. That's me and my mask. Um, because I did miss the beginning of the program, the beginning of the week programs, because I ended up out with COVID. But this is once I was back. And we, we purposely used a space that was very flexible in terms of setup. So we arranged the chairs, you know, at more of like an angle, almost like in a circle, so that everybody could see everybody else and we wanted to encourage more of a discussion so it was ended up the visit ended up being more of a conversation than a presentation and um, the author did share background information on melissa information on other titles that they have released shared um, their perspective on the rise of challenges and the dangers of censorship. And we had patrons who praised us for our representation in an author that we had selected. Afterwards, a parent came up to me and said that his children were extremely excited about this program and thanked me for bringing in a diverse author that represented a marginalized and often attacked or ridiculed community. Um, this was important to him and was especially impactful for his um, trans daughter and her friend, as well as great for his other child, uh, because Alex Gino's books are some of their favorite books. <clears throat> We ended the week with a band book film festival. We ran this on a Saturday throughout the entire day. We um, had popcorn and punch for snacks, and it was basically just a movie marathon. We started with um, like children's title, moved up to teen as we went through the day, and ended with adults. That way everybody could kind of, you know, grow along with them. In addition, we wanted to make sure that even if the programs didn't make an impact, that we had some other way to make an impact because that's what our director had specifically requested. And in order to do that, we decided we were going to put together Band Books Week activity bags. We wanted something that might inspire patrons to pick up a band book to read or, you know, support our efforts by becoming an activist and helping to spread the word throughout our service area as well as beyond. We had planned a book giveaway, um, crafts, an activist starter kit and more. 
So rather than have smaller activities featured in various branches throughout the system, we wanted to combine them into one more impactful activity that would give consistent messaging across all of our locations. And the Band Book Week activity bags was our solution to that. <clears throat> so included in the activity bag was literally the bag, a canvas bag. And we gave everybody a couple different um, colors of fabric markers so that they could decorate their bag. So um, that became like the first activity was decorate your bag. And everybody got a copy of Melissa by Alex Gino in hardback because we were not able to get paperbacks with the corrected title. And we didn't want to use the paperbacks with the dead, you know, the character's dead name on there. Um, we also had a welcome flyer and activist um, starter kit, which was put together by the National Coalition Against Censorship. And um, it's all about kids' right to read, but applies to any age group. And um, since the majority of banned books are typically children's and teen books, um, we thought that this would be great. And then the, the information does translate to any age group. So for Banned Books Week activity bags, we also included information on why you should fight for your right to read, quotes from authors, and the contact information of every government official that serves our county in our service area. So we had our, you know, senators, our representatives, people from the st you know, state level of government, the governor, and um, we also, in addition, had one more page that had every mayor's information, um, county commissioners, things like that to encourage people to write to all of their government officials to stress how important it is to not ban books. <clears throat> we had a little activity booklet in there which had information from authors about censorship. Um, it had information and links to get to additional craft ideas. There were some banned book Mad Libs, which can be quite fun if you haven't ever tried one. Um, and when you pull out all the words and start substituting them, or even just try to read it without those words, it really makes an impact on why we should not censor those materials. Ideas on, you know, how you could decorate your book bag, and as well as, you know, like a word search and some other um, word puzzles and the like. <clears throat> Last year, every location in our library system did a mystery band books display where they would wrap a bunch of band books in the brown paper there. And then we had labels that were printed where they could write why it was banned. And it was incredible to see how fast these actually went. And we had to wrap more because even the extras that we had on had from the beginning were not enough. <clears throat> um, two of two of my favorites were, you know, like the one on the left was banned for fostering an inclusive environment. Um, you know, how da how dare a book, you know, foster an environment of inclusivity. And the other on the left was being obscene because it contained a black queer character. 
because that, you know, obviously makes it, you know, immediately obscene just for having the character, even though there was no sex whatsoever in the book. Um, <clears throat> some additional displays that some locations did was, you know, they would put information about a book and why it was banned and did a guessing contest to see if someone could guess what which book it was. Um, we also did guess the shredded band book where you'd put out a jar full of all the shredded pieces of a band book and um, see if they could figure out what book it was. But don't worry, no usable books were harmed in the creation of that dis display con or contest. <clears throat> we also did a Banned Books Week uh, bingo card where um, we did separate ones, one for children, one for young adult books. And um, this was just to encourage people to read different banned books. And then once they got a bingo, five in a row, they were able to come in for a prize, which was, you know, depending on the age, we had stink stickers, little trinkets, um, Dayton Metro Library swag, um, and some other, you know, things like that. <clears throat> We also made Band Book Week buttons for everybody on staff, and those had different quotes from different um, band books. This one was one of my favorite quotes, living with stress and secrets is both stressful and secretive. It's right up the alley of, you know, how my brain works. Um, but we had that, there was also a, you don't, have to like everyone, but you don't have to be a jerk about it either. That one was from uh, New Kid by Jerry Craft. <clears throat> and another one was, I give myself very good advice, but I very seldom follow it. And that's um, from Alice's, Wonders, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Um, <clears throat> if you do something like this, if you have a button maker, the supplies are really surprisingly inexpensive. It's the equipment to make the buttons that's the where you um, have the expense. But I will say that, you know, if you have a large staff, plan accordingly because it took a while to make 500 bu buttons in um, some supposed free time because we all know how much of free time we all have. <clears throat> You know, so I can tell you that on February 15th of this year, Dayton Metro Library's Board of Trustees unanimously passed a resolution declaring Dayton Metro Library and all of its branch locations as book sanctuaries. <clears throat> um, we got the idea from the book sanctuary website which was started with Chicago Public Libraries. And <clears throat> becoming a book sanctuary means, you know, we knew that we could never be successful in promoting and protecting the freedom to read if we only do it during Banned Books Week. You know, it needs to be a priority year round. And there's basically three aspects to um, being a book sanctuary, much of which is stuff we're already, you know, should be doing. It's a place to collect and protect endangered books. We bring diverse characters and stories into our book talks, book clubs, displays, and programs. And it's a place to educate others on the history of banning and why it's so important to protect their right to read what they want. <clears throat> and we all know that the numbers have been climbing and that's just one reason why this is so important. <clears throat> so for us to become a, a book sanctuary, we, I had to formulate a resolution, which I had never done before 
but thank goodness for ALA because they had a lot of information on how to write one. <clears throat> so for ours, I'm not expecting anyone to be able to read this picture here, um, but I will just very quickly read it because it's short, sweet, and to the point. So whereas Dayton Metro Library recognizes that the library has a responsibility to protect and promote the patron's right to read, view, or listen to materials and resources protected by the First Amendment, no matter the viewpoint of the author, creator, or selector, whereas the library provides informational, recreational, and educational support to a diverse population and the Board of Trustees directs that the library be inclusive rather than exclusive in developing its collections. Whereas the library will provide access to information across the broadest spectrum of disciplines and points of view without directly or indirectly banning or censoring any material that might otherwise meet the stipulations of the library's policy. Whereas the library recognizes that library users make their own choices as to what materials they will use based on individual interests and concerns, and that the library should not exclude materials on the grounds that they may be deemed offensive by others or inappropriate for children. <clears throat> Whereas the library's collection is available to all in the community with decisions about the suitability of materials for minor children being the responsibility of their parents and legal guardians. And whereas the library assumes no responsibility for restricting any patron's access to the items in the, our collection, therefore be it resolved that on the 15th day of February 2023, the members of the Board of Trustees of the Dayton Metro Library formally designate Dayton Metro Library and all of its branches as book sanctuaries, and be it further resolved that the Dayton Metro Library will collect and ensure access to endangered library materials and protect library materials from bans and censorship. I can tell you when I had to write that, a lot of that is literally a whereas followed by something from our collection development policy. Um, so I didn't have to be all that original. I mean, a lot of this is stuff that we were already doing. It was already a part of our, um, already part of our strategic plan and already part of our collection development policy. So it was just kind of pulling things from a few different resources within our library and putting it all together in one document. <clears throat> so how did we become a book sanctuary? Well, after Band Book Week last year, I met with the director to get permission and to work out a plan because you know I told him you know the committee had talked and we can't be successful if we're only worrying about this one week out of the year during band books week he was 100 percent on board he had read articles about this as well and um Plus in our strategic plan, it's, it specifically says bridging our community, prior, prioritizing equity, diversity, and inclusion, increasing access to library resources for minority, disadvantaged, and new residents, diversifying engagement opportunities for stakeholders and connecting patrons with support system. But most importantly, build equity in our community. And so much of this cannot be done if diverse books are being banned or challenged all the time. So like I said, the I wrote the resolution, um, met with um, all of our top administration, we kind of fine tuned a few things. And then I presented the resolution to the board with an explanation of why I felt it was important. Questions were answered and the board unanimously voted in favor of the resolution. So this is actually a way that the li that our library is reinforcing our commitment to providing our community with 
you know, diverse, inclusive materials and services and, you know, to protect their freedom to read, which are all parts of our strategic plan. <clears throat> um, next steps beyond that for us was start planning for Band Books Week of this year, which I spoke about what we did um, a little bit before here. And um, <clears throat> we officially joined Unite Against Book Bans as an institution. Um, that's through ALA. And we also did press releases about our status as a book sanctuary. I went on two different local um, talk shows and um, talked about being a book sanctuary, what that means, why it's important. Um, we added signage in all of our branches and um, informational pamphlets. We had digital signage on our digital signs. It's on our website. We did a program series throughout the year that we just kicked off. Um, we've been promoting this on all of our social media in our print materials. And the next step for us is we are gonna start approaching local government um, entities for to ask them if they would also put together a proclamation declaring our cities that we serve as book sanctuaries in addition to just the library being a book sanctuary. Um, <clears throat> in Chicago, it started with the Chicago Public Library being a book sanctuary. From there, it grew to the mayor of Chicago declaring that Chicago is a sanctuary city and therefore they were going to be a sanctuary city for books as well. So they declared the entire city as a book sanctuary. And now it has actually gone to the point where legislation has banned book bans in their area as well. <clears throat> Um, some other different organizations that, you know, we're approaching and things that we're using on an individual basis, not necessarily as the whole institution, but there's Take Action for Libraries, an end ban books uh, movement, the ABC Literacy site, Fight for the First, um, which is all First Amendment, you know, um, movements. And um, I also follow very closely with the National Coalition Against Censorship and information that is put out from ALA as well. <clears throat> so what's something that you can do about this issue? Well, you can become a book sanctuary. You can do your best to fight against censorship, against book challenges and bans. You can take a stand. You can draw that line in the sand that you are not going to cross. You can do this individually. You can also do it as a library system. You can declare your own personal library at home a book sanctuary. You know, you can sign petitions you can um, educate your patrons, educate your family and your friends about why it's important to protect everyone's First Amendment rights and everyone's um, right to read what they want. <clears throat> you can also um, work with your administration on declaring your library a book sanctuary. Um, it is a pillar of library science and like a foundational piece of public libraries to provide free, unrestricted access to information. Um, so, you know, it literally is not a departure from being a public library to be a book sanctuary. It is part of 
what we are called to do as a foundational pillar of who we are. <clears throat> So there are, if you start doing a uh, Google search and start looking for them, there are so many um, pledges you can take and petitions you can sign, anything along those lines. So even if you can't get your, your library designated as a book sanctuary, these are all things you can do on your own as well. <clears throat> and I actually got through all 39 slides with like time to spare. That's got to be a new one for me. I usually talk so much that there's no time for questions. <clears throat> but I am definitely open to questions if anyone has questions about what we did, um, how we did different things anything along those lines. Feel or if there's anything I talked about that you want like more explanation of, I'm happy to do that as well. Just going to say feel free to type them in the chat or unmute yourself and talk to us. You explained everything so well, there's no questions. <laughs> <laughs> I highly doubt that. <laughs> so if you want to jot down my um, contact information, if, you know, anything you think of anything later that, you know, I'm happy to answer questions later. I do see one that came in. Did you meet any resistance in the community? No, we actually did not. Um, the feedback we have gotten from this is, has been nothing but positive. Now, I realize that, you know, every community is different, but we serve everywhere from very conservative rural areas to very liberal, you know, urban areas in our in our library service area. And there has not been a single negative that has come in to my knowledge. You're welcome. I think part of it is also like how you word it. Like we're doing this to protect your right to read, you know, what you want to read. And, you know, we have no problem with a parent not wanting their child to read something, but that's that parent's responsibility to enforce that. Um, we just provide the information, provide the resources. And we've been, I mean, we've been on our uh, local NPR station. We've been in the newspaper multiple times about this. You know, our director even had a quote saying, you know, it's perfectly fine for a parent to say what their child can and can't read, but it's not their right to tell everyone else in the community what they can and cannot read. I think in framing it as, you know, we're doing this for you and we're protecting your rights, um, <clears throat> that does help. Did you notice this encourage more pa patrons getting involved or did it cause a pullback? I've not seen any kind of pullback. Um, 
our attendance at different programming um, dealing with intellectual freedom has grown. Um, now, how much patrons are doing after they leave as far as getting involved, that I'm not certain of, but we did have um, dozens of patrons ask if they can get book sanctuary t-shirts as well. Um, and there has been enough interest that we actually have some staff members that are looking into the possibility of just ordering some and um, having them on hand to sell. Or if we can't do that, like just taking orders in advance, you know, getting them printed and then you know, distributing them to everybody who had paid for one. So I guess in that way, I would say they are getting more involved, um, not pulling back. Well, perfect. We are pretty much at time. So we are. Oh, there. I was like, another question. No. Uh, so thank you so much, Steve, for being here and telling us all of this and taking your time with us. Oh, you're welcome. Reach out anytime, anybody with any questions, or if you want me to share anything that I shared with you, I can do that as well. Perfect. That is it for today for our conference, and we have more for you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Thanks, everyone, for attending all day. Thank you again, Kim. I'm going to go ahead and log off. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you.